I want you to turn to two passages of Scripture, right? Ezekiel 34 and Mark 4. Ezekiel chapter 34 and Mark chapter 4. Uh, we're in a series uh, called The Holy Bible Beyond Words. And God is really pulling us back into the Word of God. And I want to encourage you, if you have children that um, are young children, I want to encourage you to buy them a Bible. Here's what we did. We ordered a, a whole bunch of Bibles uh, for both bookstores, South Lake and North Richland Hills. Uh, this is a study called the Adventure Bible. This would probably be for fourth through sixth graders. This is the NIV, actually the NIV Bible. This Bible is probably for third grade and below, even down to one or two years old, because uh, it has pictures in it like this and stories. And you could just read them a story uh, before they go to bed. One lady said to me, you know, I, I tried that, but he goes to sleep. Thank God. <laughs> you found something to put him to sleep. That's great. So, but here's the point. Even after he goes to sleep, just keep on reading the story. Because his spirit is listening. And I really want to encourage you to read the Bible to your children because it will bear fruit in later years. I also want to encourage you to do something else. This last 10 days, Debbie and I were very, very busy. Uh, we had a, a, a board meeting. I serve on the board of trustees for a seminary and spoke uh, in, a, in a two churches and then had another apostolic meeting uh, overseeing some churches and things like that. And I had a lot of people say to me, uh, Pastor Robert, uh, we're, we, we've really been praying for you because we know your schedule has been busy. And I thought for a moment, how do, how do they know? And then I remembered Twitter, <laughs> the miracle of Twitter. And so I, I thought about this. I would really like for every member of Gateway Church to uh, get on Twitter. And even if you're computer illiterate, you know someone who is computer literate. Have that person help you. If they don't follow you, you can keep your anonymity, I promise you, because I wouldn't have done it if you couldn't. But I think in a church our size, it is a great way for me to be able to communicate to you things that I want to communicate and for you to know where we are and you can pray for us specifically. So just go to twitter.com, sign up, and then I am Pastor Robert Morris or P.S. Robert Morris, all right? And uh, that way uh, we can get a lot of people praying for us, <laughs> and I would love that. And I appreciate uh, all of you who pray for us on a regular basis. All right, we're in this series called the Holy Bible. And I want to tell you, I know you're in Ezekiel 34, and I'm going to get there in just a moment, but I want to tell you how I got so hungry for the Word. Uh, I'd, I'd gotten saved, and I started doing youth meetings, and I was traveling with James Robison. And uh, most of us know James and Betty, they're members of the church here. And uh, I was traveling with him, and I was doing junior high and high school school assemblies on drugs and alcohol and things like that. And then I would invite the kids to the Crusades. And James began to uh, met someone that began to get him in the Word, and it started changing his life. And he just couldn't get enough of the Word. But he was started preaching on uh, demonic spirits and this spiritual warfare that we all go through. And so I said to him one day, Hey, um, I don't understand about all these things you're preaching about. And so he said, well, why don't you and Debbie come over to the house. We'll make some homemade ice cream, and we'll, uh, we'll just get in the Word. That was his, his saying at the time, we'll get in the Word. So we went over, and uh, we had some ice cream, and James started reading some verses. And I remember he read this one verse. Again, I know we're not there, but he read this verse. He'd been reading a bunch of verses, but he got this verse. Psalm 74, verse 3 says, Lift up your feet to the perpetual desolations, the enemy has damaged everything in the sanctuary. The enemy has damaged everything in the sanctuary. And so James said to me, um, who's the enemy? Well, I, I knew. Everyone knows that. I said, Satan. He says, uh-huh. And where does it say he is in? And I said, the sanctuary. I said, man, everyone knows that the devil's gotten into the church. I know that. And then he said this to me. Now, what I'm about to tell you might rattle you because it rattled me. Here's what he said. Point to the sanctuary. 
And I said, wait a minute. I said, are you telling me I got demons? He said, oh, man, you got a whole flock of them. <laughs> and it, it rattled me. He said, let's just keep reading. I said, well, let's get them out. He said, no, we just need to keep reading the Word. Let's just read the Word. Let's just read the Word. We need to fill our houses with the Word of God. Well, as he kept reading, I remember this because it's the first and only time I have ever let homemade vanilla ice cream melt. <laughs> but I was rattled, you know. But it began to make sense to me. All of a sudden, I, I started thinking about it. See, I, I was in ministry. I'd been saved a couple of years. I loved Jesus with all my heart. But now listen to me. I still had a lot of sin in my life. And it was bondage. I mean, I couldn't get rid of it. I was very insecure, very fearful, very afraid, very, uh, had a lot of rejection, had a lot of anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, had lust, even had some sexual immorality in my life. And I really loved Jesus, but I didn't know how to get free. And all of a sudden, it began to make sense to me that we have an enemy, and just because we're Christians doesn't mean that the enemy's not going to come after us. As a matter of fact, he, we are the ones he's coming after. You need to, to, to be alert, the Bible says. Your enemy, like a roaring lion, like a wild beast, is coming after you. You need to watch out for it. So here's what happened. We started seeing some symbols in Scripture. That's the title of the message uh, today, the symbols of Scripture. And I only have time to show you a few, just a very few. I, I do a seminar that I'm thinking about doing again where I, I, for eight hours, I take people through all the spiritual symbols in the Bible. Would you like to go through that maybe? So I'm praying about doing that, all right? But so I just got a few minutes to show you just a few symbols. But look at Ezekiel chapter 34. I want to show you these spiritual symbols, all right? Ezekiel 34 verse 1 says, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Now, stop just for a moment. Look at me just for a minute. Do you think that God is telling Ezekiel, his prophet, to prophesy against literal shepherds? The guys that stand out there on the side of a hill with a stick and a dress, do you think that's who he's talking about? No. Who do you think he's talking to? Pastors, right? Spiritual leaders. Okay, so here's what you're telling me. The Bible says shepherds, but it doesn't mean literal shepherds. It means spiritual shepherds. Now, I agree with you. I agree with you. My only point is that we do this with some words in the Bible, but we don't look for the spiritual meaning in the other words. So I want you to watch it, all right? Woe to the shepherds. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is verse 2, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Remember I told you that's my main responsibility. You eat the flat, fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. Um, verse 4 goes through the five basic ministries of Jesus that are listed in Luke 4. I don't have time to, to explain all of this, but I'll mention them to you. The weak you have not strengthened, that's the baptism in the Holy Spirit because we get power, strength. Nor have you healed those who are sick, that's healing. Nor bound up the broken, that's inner healing. Nor brought back that which was driven away, that's deliverance, because they were driven away to the land of the enemy. Nor sought that which was lost, that's evangelism. Those are the five basic ministries of Jesus. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, healing, inner healing, deliverance, and salvation. All right? Now, verse 5. Well, it says, verse 4, says, but with force and cruelty you've ruled them. Verse 5. So they were scattered. Now, who was scattered? Before we go, on, who, who scattered? Sheep. But... Is he talking about literal sheep or is he talking about people? People, right? So they, people, has a spiritual meaning. They were scattered because there was no shepherd. Now he's talking about leaders, spiritual leaders. And they, the sheep, watch, became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. Okay, here's what bothers me. We say, now sheep, that doesn't mean real sheep. That means people. And shepherds, that's not talking about the guys out there literally watching over sheep. That's talking about pastors. But now beasts of the field, that's lions and tigers. No, that's spiritual lions. That's demonic spirits. And here's what happens. When we don't feed ourselves with the Word of God 
And when we're not in a good church where we're being fed the Word of God, the beast of the field come get us. And we go into bondage. All right? Now, I'm telling you, beast of the field represents, and I don't have time to show you all the scriptures. And I'd love for you to just take a concordance yourself and look up beasts of the field all through the Bible. I'm telling you, it represents the demonic. It represents fallen angels who are demonic spirits who come after believers. This is what got me so excited about reading the Bible. This is why I read Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Nahum, Zechariah, uh, Micah, Malachi, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, because I saw all of a sudden that this was a spiritual book written by a spiritual being to a spiritual being. And it's incredible when you see it that way. All right? Let me show you another scripture. We, we, I, we'll get to Mark 4 in a minute. Genesis 3, verse 1 says, Now the serpent, now the serpent, now stop just for a minute, look at me. This is talking about in the Garden of Eden. And it says, Now the serpent. Now I want to ask you a question. Who's the serpent? Satan or the devil, right? Everybody knows that. But what book, chapter, and verse do you have to prove that? Here's the reason I'm asking you this. Every symbol that I give you, if I give you a symbol and say, this is a symbol that represents this, I can give you a book, chapter, and verse for it. So I'm not talking about just making up or thinking. I think this represents this. Well, the way you find out is you take that word and you read it every time it's in the Bible and let the Bible interpret itself. You see what I'm saying? Now, let me just give you the verse, by the way, real simple to show you that we know for sure the serpent is Satan. I'm just going to give you one because there's, there's several of them. Revelation 12, 9 says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. Okay? So I know for sure that the serpent is Satan. Now, before I go back and read Genesis 3, let me show you something. It says the serpent. The Bible says, your Bible says the serpent. But all of us think Satan. Immediately. We, you already believe in spiritual symbols. Because when you read serpent, even though there might have been a literal snake in the garden talking to Eve, it wasn't a snake, it was Satan talking through. And we know that, all right? Now, watch this, though. Remember we read that when sheep are scattered, they become food for the beasts of the field, right? And we said beasts of the field are fallen angels, demonic spirits. Watch this, Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Is it possible that what that's saying is not that the snake is smarter than any monkey? Is it possible that it's saying, now Satan is the most cunning of all the fallen angels? See, this book is really fun when you understand, yes, there's a literal meaning to it, but there could be a spiritual meaning as well. Uh, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, who was tempting him in the wilderness? Who was there? Satan, the devil, right? Okay. Do you think any of the demons were there? <laughs> uh, would you? Uh, come on. It, it, if you were Satan and you ruled over these demonic spirits and the Son of God comes to earth, would you go by yourself or would you take a whole bunch of people with you? You'd take every demonic spirit you could get with you, right? Well, wouldn't it be amazing if the Bible told us that, but we just hadn't quite seen it. Mark chapter 1 verse 13 says, And he was there in the wilderness... 40 days tempted by Satan and was with the wild beast and the angels ministered to him. Now, maybe that means that the lions and tigers were with him in the wilderness. But maybe it means something else too. It's just, I'm t this is what got me hungry for the Bible is what I'm telling you. I started seeing these symbols. All right, now Mark chapter 4. I told you to put a marker at Mark 4. Let me show you Mark chapter 4. I'll show you another symbol, and it's real easy to see it. Mark chapter 4, verse 1. Again, he began to teach by the sea. And a great multitude was gathered to him, so they got in a boat. He sat in it on the sea, and the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. Then he taught them many things by parables, and he said to them in his teaching, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Now, do you see that? Some seed fell by the wayside and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Verse 9 says, And he said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. There, uh, now, apparently there were people there that day that did not have literal ears on the side of their heads. 
Do you think Jesus was talking about physical ears? No, he was talking about spiritual ears, right? Why would he be talking about spiritual ears unless there was a spiritual symbol here, all right? So they said, verse 10, but when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parable. Verse 13, he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, so seed represents the word, and we know in 1 Peter that it is incorruptible, not corruptible seed. Verse 15, and these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. Okay, wait a minute. Uh, what did verse 4 say? Verse 4 said the birds of the air. Then they said to Jesus, now you have to understand something. This is Jesus. This is not my opinion anymore. This is Jesus. They said to Jesus, what does that mean? Jesus said, well, what that means is that when someone sows the word of God, Satan comes and tries to take the word. But Jesus called Satan and all of his demonic forces the birds of the air. So that clues me in when I start reading the birds of the air in other places that it might mean something. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, flip back to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. Now remember the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Do you remember in Daniel, where was Daniel when Daniel was written? Do you, do you remember? He was in a city. He was in the city of Babylon, right? Babylon was a mixture of the world and the church. The children of Israel went captive into the, to Babylon, the city of Babylon, for 70 years. And there was a mixture then, and they began to mix their worshiping practices other than a remnant. So is it possible that Babylon represents a mixture of the world and the church, or could we call it a worldly church? All right? So watch what happens. The king of Babylon has a dream. Daniel 4, verse 10. He's explaining his dream. These were the visions of my head while on my bed. I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth. Its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Is this possible? This is talking about a worldly church, a worldly system. Its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. Watch. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heaven dwelt in its branches. And all flesh, not spirit, flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed, there was a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven. He cried and said, chop down the tree and cut off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beast get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump. Okay. Now, by the way, when Daniel interprets the dream, uh, he says, uh, this is you, king. This is, this is Babylon. That's what this is. This is you. And he gives the interpretation of the dream, all right? But he said, here's what's going to happen. This thing is, grows, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And when it gets bigger, the birds of the air come nest in the branches, and the beasts of the field come under the shade. Well, we've already read Mark chapter 4, what the birds of the air were. We know what they are, represent. We read Ezekiel 34 about the beasts of the field coming after the sheep. Are you all following me? I'm just telling you, there are symbols and signs all over this book that make it fun to read. And we just read over it. Now, here's the great thing. He said, nevertheless, I'm going to bring judgment against this worldly system. I'm going to bring judgment against the worldly church. I'm going to bring judgment against it. I'm going to cut it down. But I'm going to leave a stump. I'm going to leave the stump. Uh, Isaiah 6, 13 says, Whose stump remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be the stump. <laughs> the holy seed shall be the stump, which refers to the remnant of God. So I got all these scriptures that I think, this, I used to do this in an eight-hour seminar, and I just figure that y'all are mature enough to get it all in a few minutes. <laughs> so I know I may stir up a lot of questions for you, but I hope I do. I hope you get so many questions that you think, I'm just going to have to read the Bible, see if what he said is true. I'm going to read the, I'm going to read the whole thing. Uh, Matthew 13, let me read you this. You, you've read this parable before, but maybe you've never thought about 
what the birth. Now, before I read this, and if you want to turn to it, it's fine. But listen to me. We read Mark chapter 4 where Jesus said the birds of the air, and when they asked him to explain it, he said, that's Satan. That's, his, that's Satan and his demonic forces. We know his demons help do it, carry out his work. All right? Jesus said that, the birds of the air. Now watch this. Maybe you've never seen this this way. Matthew 13, verse 31, says, Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it's greater than the herbs, and it becomes, this is very important, it's supposed to be a herb, it's supposed to be a small bush actually, but it becomes a tree, a large tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. <laughs> is it possible that Jesus wanted us to preach the kingdom of God the way he preached it? Repent and come to Jesus. Turn from sin and come to Jesus. Yes, preach grace, but is it possible when you think about it, there are millions of people in the world that name themselves as Christians that don't even go to church, don't read their Bible, live in sin, and we've got a huge worldly church. Is it possible Jesus is saying, let me tell you what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's really like a small bush. But when it grows and becomes a big tree, remember Babylon, the, the dream that he had? It's the exact same thing. The birds of the air come and nest in the branches. It would be good if we knew what the branches represented, wouldn't it? You got any scripture on the branches? John 15, 3. I am the vine. Are you getting a little rattled like I was that night? Listen to me very carefully. Because you might be saying, are you saying I got demons? You might have a whole flock. That's why we believe in freedom ministry here. It's amazing to me how people say, well, Christians... Christians can't be in bondage to demons. Well, who do you think the demons are going after? They're not going after the world. The world's on their side. They're going after the church because if they can keep the church in bondage, then they can keep the church from presenting Jesus to the world. There's some pretty amazing verses in the Bible. Matter of fact, Ezekiel 31 talks about, again, a worldly church. And this is what it says in verse 6. All the birds of the heavens made their nest in its boughs. Under its branches, all the beasts of the field brought forth their young. Now watch this phrase. And in its shadow, all great nations made their home. There's a whole lot of scriptures on the beasts of the field and the birds there. I'm going to show you two more scriptures. Daniel 7, says, And the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you little by little. You will be unable to destroy them at once, lest the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Now, this is talking about when the children of Israel went in to possess the promised land, and they had all these enemy nations around them. Now, let me explain something to you. We get saved. The children of Israel got saved by the blood of the Lamb, they went through the Red Sea, which 1 Corinthians said represents water baptism. Then the cloud descended on them, and God wrote his law on tablets of stone. The cloud descending represents the Spirit descending, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, because when the cloud descends, God writes his law on tablets of flesh. He writes his law in our hearts. So they did that, and then they go through this wilderness, this dry season, but then they enter the promised land. But when they entered the promised land, everything wasn't, in, wasn't perfect. What happened in the promised land? They had to drive the enemy out of their land. They had to conquer the enemy. That's where we are as believers. We've been saved. We've been water baptized. We've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. We are now driving the enemy out of our land. And if we drive the enemy out of our land, we'll have victory. We'll possess the land that God's given us. By the way, 1 Corinthians 3, 9 says, you are God's field. You're God's field. So we're driving the enemy out of our land. And here's what he says. Here's how I'm going to let you drive them out. Little by little. Little by little. And the reason why is so the beasts of the field don't become too numerous for you. And we already know what the beasts of the field represents, right? But let me show you now a New Testament scripture that goes along with this. And again, I think we missed it. 
many times. We haven't seen what it's talking about. Matthew 13, verse 43 says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man. Now, let me, let me just say something. Could this be any clearer? An unclean spirit's a demon. This is Jesus talking. By the way, this is in red, okay? When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, this is what the demon of lust or the demon of pride says, I will return to my house, notice he calls it a house, a person, from which I came. And when he comes, this is very important, he finds it empty, empty, notice the word empty, swept, that would be clean, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it be also with this wicked generation. Okay. God said, I'm going to, let, I'm going to deliver you from the nations little by little so that the beasts of the field don't increase, become too numerous for you. That's an Old Testament scripture. It's an analogy. Then we come to the New Testament. Jesus said, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he'll try to come back in. He'll try to come back. And if he finds that house, now listen, this is very important. Clean, the house is clean. He's repented of his sin. Put in order. He's put some things in his life. They're good things now. Here's the key though. But empty. Empty. He'll come back and he'll bring seven more spirits. Now I just want to ask something. And I could ask this about you, but I'm going to ask it about someone you know. Have you ever known someone that was in bondage to something? Maybe they had an addiction and they got free and then they went back into bondage and it was worse than the first time. You say, well, what's the key? Listen, here's the key. It's very, very simple. When you get set free, you've got to fill your house with the Word of God. Because this is the only thing that defeats the enemy. God's word. So as you're getting free, little by little, and we're all getting free little by little, as you're getting free, you just keep filling your house. You just keep filling your house with the word of God. So when the spirit comes back, he can't bring seven more. He can't take you into bondage, and it's even worse than before. This is exactly what happened the very first time I realized that I had bondages in my life when James Robinson said to me, I said, James, let's get them out. He said, no, let's fill your house with the Word of God so that when they leave, they stay gone. Can I just tell you again, the Holy Bible is beyond words. It is more important than we think to read this book because this book is the key that sets us free. Psalm 107 verse 20 said, He sent His word and healed them and delivered them. I know a lot of people that need healing and a lot of people that need deliverance. And Psalm 107 20 says, it's through this book. He sent His word and healed them and delivered them. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I know this was a little different sermon normally than what I preach. But I knew that I had to just get us in some scripture that would create in us a hunger for God's word because we need the word of God. We need the word of God to get free and we need the word of God to remain free. So what's the Holy Spirit saying to you? What's the Holy Spirit saying to you? We want to pray for you. No matter which campus you're attending, we want to pray for you. If you're going through a difficulty, if there is a bondage in your life you need to get free from, we want to pray for you. In just a moment, we're going to stand. And when we stand, we're going to have some leaders here at the front at both campuses, South Lake and North Richland Hills. And when we stand up in just a moment, you simply stand up and step out and come and let us pray for you. 
all right? No matter which campus you're attending, when we stand, if you need some prayer, please don't be embarrassed. You don't have to be a member of Gateway Church to come for prayer. You come and let us pray for you, all right? Holy Spirit, I pray you'll draw every person, every person that has any prayer need, in Jesus' name, amen.